Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Toba mentions a beautiful verse and he discusses the love of Allah and His Rasul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if your children and your parents, your offspring, your businesses, your trade, your commerce, all of these things, if these things are more beloved to you than Allah and His Rasul, then wait for the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take your account for it. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and we know that the most beloved thing to a person should be the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, in the battle of Uhud, there was a sahabi by the name of Sa'ad ibn Rabi' radiallahu an. After the battle, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we know that in, in the battle of Uhud, to a certain extent, that was, a fir- that was, not to a certain extent, that was the first defeat the Muslims had suffered. After the battle, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Zayd bin Hadith radiallahu an. He tells him that where is Sa'ad bin, Sa'ad bin Rabi' Where is he? He says, I have no idea. He says, go find him. So Zayd bin Hadith radiallahu an, he starts scanning the plains of Uhud. First, he goes to the side of Uhud where there's the Sahaba which are living. He cannot find Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah Then he goes to the side of the battlefield where the Shuhada are laid, all those who have passed away in Uhud. And he sees Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah laying in this area. And it mentions the Ruwaya with about 70 sword wounds on his body. 70 sword wounds on his body. Zayd bin Haditha sees him, he kneels down, he grabs his hand, and he says, Oh Sa'ad, in what condition do I find you? And he was, this was Sa'ad ibn Rabi radiallahu anhu was basically about to pass away. This was, these were his final moments. And look at the conversation that he has. Zayd bin Hadith radiallahu anhu then says, Oh Sa'ad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was asking about you. He wanted me to see where you are, to inquire about you. As he's passing away, Sa'ad ibn Rabi radiallahu anhu, he says, You see my condition. O Zayn bin Hadith, tell the Nabi of Allah that may he be elevated above all other messengers in this world and the hereafter. And then he says that لا عذر لكم إن خلص إلى نبيكم وفيكم عين تطرف He said, I want you to deliver a message to my people. He says, I want you to deliver a very particular message. As he's dying, he says, let them know that they will have no excuse on the day of Qiyamah. They will, I will hold them accountable. Allah will hold them accountable on the day of Qiyamah if they are breathing and they are alive. And Rasulullah wasallam is harmed even by the, you know, the smallest margin. I will hold them accountable. These were his final words. He did not speak about leaving behind two daughters which he had. He did not speak about his business. He did not speak about his, his commerce. He did not speak about who will look after my family. He had entrenched in his heart what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in that verse, that Allah and his Rasul must be more beloved to you than anything in this world. And he was a living example of this. Now in the month of Ramadan, practically, what are some things we can do? Because the ulama mentioned that the love that it's mentioned in that verse, meaning the love for your family members and your business and your commerce, these are, lo- these are things that Ibn Jawzi rahimahullah mentioned as hub filtri, meaning you have a natural inclination to them. And then he said that the love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is hub ikhtiyari, meaning you have to develop that love. You have to, to plant the seeds of that love. Meaning it doesn't come natural. You have to plant, you have to work on loving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not one of us will enter Jannah until he is more beloved to us than everything else in this world. So number one thing we can do is sending a lot of durood. In this month of Ramadan, let us send abundant durood upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Various narrations from us, Anas bin Malik, Abdullah bin Abbas, and one hadith, Umar bin Farooq, Umar radiallahu anhu, his narration is that when you make dua, your dua is, 
is suspended between the heavens and the earth until unless you send durood that dua will not go to the arsh. Another hadith, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh said that every time you say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or any form of the durood, ten sins are forgiven and you are elevated ten stages. Every time, all you have to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says what in the Quran? Inna Allah, Allah, wa malaikatahu, his angels, yusalluna ala al-nabi. They consistently send salawat upon the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala Hamid al-Majid. Respected brothers and sisters, now we're in that second, the second ten days of Ramadan. The midway is approaching. Every deed that we do holds great value. Time is slipping away. Ayyamu ma'dudat, I keep mentioning this, few selected days. So a lot of durood, a lot of istighfar. The second thing that I would like for all of us as a community, inshallah, to do in this month of Ramadan is along with sending durood as much as you can, especially on Fridays, the shortest one which is sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is everyone should make an attempt to start reading a sirah book. In whatever language you're comfortable in. If it's the English language, there's many books. Rahibul Maktoum, Muhammad by Martin Lynx, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Urdu has many books, Arabic. Everyone. Because remember, it's hub ikhtiyari. We have to cultivate that love. We have to develop and grow that love. What better way to grow that love than by reading the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So two things I ask of, of, this, of us as a community, including myself, is... We send abundant durood from now till the end of the month of Ramadan and forever, inshallah. And number two is we start reading to some level a sirah, book on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu And we start that immediately, inshallah. Even if you get through only a few pages, there will be immense barakah in this. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdi, ka ashadu la ilaha illa ka nastaghfiru ka wa ntumdi. We usually have the daily tafsir here um, after salah. Alhamdulillah, we have, um, mashallah, a visiting scholar here today. I know it's in the salah. Um, and we requested him to, inshallah, give us some nasiha, some words of advice, um, as was the norm of our elders when they would see other ulama come and they would try to take benefit from them. So, Sheikh Saad Qadri is here. Uh, he needs no introduction. He's been in the Chicago community for many years. He's a mentor to many of us who are studying in the early 2000s. Um, he's currently teaching, I believe, at NBC Academy. Uh, he did Imam for many years, mashallah. Very knowledgeable scholar and alim. And inshallah, I'm hoping that we can take some benefit, inshallah. So I would request that we give our undivided attention, inshallah, and take advantage of this great opportunity. <coughs> Arsa mentioned that you go through just small tafsir. Do you have the entire just? just no, they, they do the juz, but we just pick and choose ayah. Pick and choose ayah, okay. 14. 14. Or anything else you'd like to speak on, inshallah.
14 Jews is replete, it's filled with examples from the lives of our predecessors and actually through human history. Because what's so interesting about the 14 Jews, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this particular Jews, He begins it with a testimony to really what the month of Ramadan is about. The month of Ramadan is the month of Qur'an. So Ramadan al-ladhi unzila fi Qur'an. But the word, the, this idea of Qur'an, what is Qur'an? Because we often say Qur'an. So Qur'an, the scholars, they say, is up to, there's different opinion, but many scholars, there's four definitions for the term Qur'an. This word, when you say Qur'an, what does this word, word formally mean? So some scholars, they say the word Al-Qur'an, this is the name of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I say the book of Allah ta'ala, what that refers to is the word of Allah revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the medium of Jabir alayhi wa sallam. It's its formal name. That's one interpretation. The second one is the word Qur'an comes from the word Qarina, which means to connect things together. And we see, when you study Tafsir, one of the things that we study is what are the relationships of the verses the surah, what comes before and what comes after it. For example, when you look at the end of Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah Ta'ala and Surah Al-Fatiha with the dua, إِهْدِنَا صِرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطُ الَّذِينَ نَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ مَغْبُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الْضَالِينَ We make this dua, that oh Allah guides us straight path. So how does Alif Lameen, that in Kitab, لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ وَدَنِ الْمُرْتَقِينَ connect to the previous surah? Well, the dua we're asking is oh Allah guides us a straight path, so Allah says, here is the straight path. What is straight path? ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. If you want to be on the straight path, you have to then hold on to the kitab. Also, the scholar says it's known as this word uh, Quran because this connection when you recite, you can actually connect the words and verses together. Another interpretation of the word Quran is going to be from the word Qara'a Yaqra'u, Qara'a, to recite. And the word Qur'an is in a Thu'lan form, and it's always going to be recited till the end of time. Then no matter what, the Qur'an's recitation will continue, even when you see the practice of the Imams in Tarawih prayer, that when they come to the end of their Khatam, they read Surah the Nas, the next uh, Raka'ah, what do they do? They begin with Fatiha and Alif Lameen right away, to show, symbolizing, that this is coming to an end, quote unquote, here, but then we're going to pick back up this recitation again. And then the other interpretation is Qarun. In Qarun, refer, let me get back to that in a moment, because that's going to connect to this. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because Allah Ta'ala has this, 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 this book that He gave us the Qur'an, and we often just think, oh, it's the word of Allah, we recite it, but look how much Allah Ta'ala puts emphasis on this book. Over here, Allah Ta'ala begins this juz by telling us, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْنَا الذِّكْرُ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ The إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْنَا الذِّكْرُ That verily we reveal this remembrance, وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Verily we will protect it. Now the protection of the Qur'an, see the, the, the books that came before, every book is true. The Torah is true. The Injil is true. The Every book of the Suhaf, they're true. But the Qur'an, there's no tahrif in it. There's never been a change in Qur'an. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala made that promise. Now when He made that promise, He's going to protect the Qur'an, how does He protect the Qur'an? Now Allah Ta'ala could have sent some sort of divine protection in which He covers the Qur'an, and there's in the middle of Makkah al-Mukarramah, there's one holy Qur'an that has His divine protection, and it's impenetrable by nuclear, nuclear bombs, and no lock and unlock it, etc. Allah could have done that. But Allah Ta'ala did not do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have had in the quote-unquote cloud somewhere the Qur'an that's sitting and if we ever have to access and compare it to the Qur'an today, we can access and pull it down. But that's not how Allah protected it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning of time protected Qur'an through the people who would benefit from the Qur'an. Allah ta'ala could have taken, He took the responsibility Himself. وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ but Allah Ta'ala, He is Musabib al-Asbab. He is the one who creates all of the affairs. And so Allah Ta'ala, He created Asbab. He created means by which the Qur'an is protected. So the Qur'an is protected through human beings. 
Everyone who memorizes Surah Fatiha is now a hafid of Fatiha. That person is guarding Fatiha by its by their tongue, by their heart, and we hope by action and belief as well. A person who memorizes Surah Al Ikhlas, that person is hafid of Ikhlas. They are now guarding that particular surah by word, by recitation, by belief and action as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He chose to protect the Qur'an, He actually chose to protect it through the exact same means that distorted the other books. Time didn't distort the other books. It wasn't that there was a natural disaster and ate up all the books. The people distorted the books. And there's very, I mean, there's just... Uh, our deen is full of the history of how that happened, but the people distorted the books. So the very same people, meaning the same jinns, the same creation that distorted the books, is the same means by which Allah Ta'ala protects that book. Now, if we look just, if we go just slightly further into the next page, Allah Ta'ala begins to speak about a very interesting story about the beginning of time. The conflict between Thaqalain, the two weighty ones, the jinn and mankind. The jinn used to be, according to many of the scholars upon this earth, they used to live upon this earth, and there's an erring factor in the jinn, they used to be very disobedient to Allah Ta'ala, they were sent to be destroyed, one was saved, or one was preserved, and that was Azaz, Azazir, according to uh, Ibn Abbas, he later becomes Iblis. Azazir, he's taken from the earth, by the angels, he's protected. Why? Because the angels thought that there was no need for a child to be killed unnecessarily. There's a whole story behind that as well, but it's only 15 minutes of zero, so you can ask the scholars here later, inshallah, about this, or read up on it, inshallah. But he's taken to the heavens. Now the angels are worshiping Allah, Azazia notices them worshiping. He begins to copy, 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 copy. Soon he raises up the ranks. When he raises up the ranks now, what begins to happen, he's worshipping Allah like the angels worship Allah. There's a difference. The angels do so because they have no choice. Azazil does so because what? He has a choice. He has a choice and he wants to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then after a period of time, Allah ta'ala decides that he's going to create a representative on this earth for the being of Allah. Azazil feels that he should be that representative. I am worshipping Allah, I am in the heavens, I am by choice submitting. Allah Ta'ala chooses not only a different uh, person, it's not even jinn. He chooses an entirely different creation, he chooses mankind, and he chooses Adam alayhi salam. Now in this story, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions over here, with all of the al-malaikati inni khaliqun bashara min sultanin min hama'in masnoon. That Allah Ta'ala is going to create this creation of, uh, of Bani Adam. And then when he does so, Allah Ta'ala then brings it to life and he commands the angels to bow down. Iblis, what does he do? He doesn't bow down. Azazil, he becomes Iblis. He does not bow down. So Allah Ta'ala asks, Ya Iblis, Malaka Allah Takuna Ma'asajirin. Why did you bow down? He says, I'm not going to bow down to a human being that he made out of this mixture of mud and dirt and water. So Allah Ta'ala tells him, فخرج إنك رجيم. Get out of here. You are now rejected. When Allah Ta'ala, and he says, And you'll be cursed until the day of judgment. So now at least notice his error. So he says, فَأَنْذِرْ مِنَا يَوْمِ يَبْعَثْهُمْ just let me live till the end of time. Give me respite. Allah Ta'ala says, <laughs> You can go ahead and exist. <laughs> now, we connect this back to the very beginning. The conversation continues. He says, <laughs> He says, My Lord, I'm going to take your servants on this world and begin to lead them astray, except for your servants that are what? Who are completely sincere to you. And Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes who these servants are. He says about Iblis, Iblis, you want to mislead them, fine. 
You have no power over them. And what's the police's power? He can't grab our hands and make us do anything. He can't grab our eyes and make us look at something. All he wants to be so peace and good enough. He gets whisper to us. So he says, لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانِ إِلَّا مَنْ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ You have no power over them. Except for those who choose to follow you and who become astray, you have no power over them. Now, how does this tie in? The Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember the same group that, that, that disconstructed or deconstructed the other, uh, the other um, uh, books is the same means by which Allah 